so please give, give a warm please Northampton, Massachusetts welcome to Julie <laughs> I'm going to start that with you. Some little show and tell. Thank you very much. I really don't like microphones myself. But um, we found out about the Hotel Bridge uh, because Heidi had some press on it last July, August, that we, we do a little Google alert so that, and many bridge hunters tell us about these bridges that might need expert help. So that's how we found out. So you should really be grateful to yourselves for getting it out there in the news where we could see it out in Iowa. I am so grateful to what you have going on here with the Department of Public Works and your LEED Civic Association and the Mill Greenway. The public-private partnership is what they talk about all the time that we need. You all have it right here. And you should be very grateful for that because it doesn't exist everywhere. So I am supposed to go escape, exit. So when we came, it, it was important for us to have that ice. My background in historic bridges is that my family was around an historic 1883 King Iron Bowstring for all of my life. And it was damaged in 2009 by ice flows going down the river. Our county said that you can't weld old iron no one hot rivets anymore and this bridge has to go. We begged them for time to find alternate um, positions. I ran up 700 me minutes on our phone plan that my daughter had control of and I got a mom. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? We couldn't find answers, which is why um, Working Bridges was started so that we could help other groups because our bridge was washed off its piers the following August after 10 inches of rain. And I was just stubborn enough to say, we're gonna pull it out of the river. So we still have control over our bowstring. We have been out um, working in 12 states. We've done almost 30 different site visits with the intention of getting these bridges fixed and, and using in-kind restoration techniques. I couldn't do any of this work without Nels Rayner of Box Steel. He is an expert in iron bridge restoration, in hot riveting and welding of old iron. Along with him out of Michigan is the engineer that we currently work with, who is Jim Schiffer of Schiffer Group. He, um, he was here with us that we arranged big travel. And I can tell you that when we come out on these site visits, our approach is that the big studies that you commissioned first will be, that modeling will be done, but what we have to do is assess whether we think the bridge can be fixed, attach numbers to those things so that we can give it back to you with, um, so that you can make good informed decisions as a community, whether, whether you want to go to the expense of saving this bridge. Now I can tell you that, um, can I make this go as a slideshow? I think you told me. So, well, I'll just talk then. So this is on the left is Jim Schiffer and Nels Rayner. And they are looking at the tie down rod that is on the abutment, um, on the non-expansion side of the bridge. So they were, that's something that, a, a unique detail that we don't often see. I was able to walk down the river and uh, get a great profile shot of your bridge, another advantage of having the ice. This is just a, a view down to um, the half hip vertical that are tied together. All those parts are original shows the conduit then going across. There is the pin connection and some of the damage that you see underneath. All of the, the damage components are not original to the, to the iron of the bridge. 
fair amount of rust. The, uh, the new decking was put on in 1985, so that's what 30 years of asphalt and the pan with moisture seeping down will do to, to that kind of a fix. Up close, more rust, section loss. We found that some of the diagonal rods underneath had been tied to the stringers and, and moved during restoration pre previous. There's your portal bracing and your signage, ornate. No damage to the top cord of your bridge or the top cord of either of the trusses. Very little packed rust, which is rust that happens between um, a, a, a plate and the, the channel angle that goes next to it that can push it, the plates apart. There's a good example of the conduit that's running across and the bottom pins with verticals. Some broken railing that can all be repaired and straightened using a torch and hammers. This is the abutment, uh, the pin connection at the foot. There is a fair amount of section loss in that area that needs to be repaired. That happens with lack of maintenance when dirt and trees and debris can get up and just lay on top of the shoes. One of your jobs moving forward would be to keep your bridge clean. This is an example of where the rod was cut and moved forward and attached to a stringer. Um, again, that's new steel that is rusting. That's not the old iron that's really rusting. You can see that the, uh, the rod that's coming down to that doesn't have nearly the same amount of rust. I should be using my, my pointer. Geez, see? The pin connection. Uh, your abutments are in good shape. They could take some, some new pointing, uh, no cracking, no, no major. You could inject some grout into those areas to keep it cleaner. And there's Heidi. <laughs> so that's, that's what we looked at. When we were out under your bridge, um, we... Uh, we really got an up close and personal look at the bridge. Now, some of the, um, and that, but we couldn't see the decking. And the, the site looked pretty tight with all those, all the snow around that you had then. I can't believe I'm wearing boots again today. I, I think maybe I brought the weather back. So let's just see now. Now I forget, Justin, what I... Command L. Command L, thank you. So what we did, and, and this may be hard to see, so I'm gonna bring it up. So what you have is an 1880 Wrought Iron Bridge Company, Canton, Ohio, Pratt Trust Bridge. And you know, the length is 129 feet, approximately 13 feet wide with a deck width of 11 feet two. As I said, it was built to move um, buggies and horses, but mostly to get people across the river from the far side where the, where the hotel had been to the button factory on, on Main Street side of your bridge. Uh, we found that the roadway stringers and floor beams all need to be replaced. The lower cord shoes, which are at each, four of them at each abutment that hold the inclined end posts, are also in, in bad shape. Uh, the stone abutments are in good shape. They need some pointing. The asphalt deck is deteriorating and the pan underneath. The uh, future use, which is key, the, the end game. You love your bridge. Everywhere across the country, the same stories about your bridges. They mean something to a community. And it goes back a very long way. 
So, you know, we think you're, you're well within your rights to want to save it. It is a focal point of Leeds. The historic value is that it no doubt will be placed on the historic register. It is the oldest Pratt style bridge in your state. There's no reason to move it forward and not put it on the register. Now being on the register will not keep this bridge from being demolished. There is no real teeth to being on the register, but it will allow you to apply for some grants through either the state preservation office or through um, your transportation enhancement <laughs> grants through the DOT. So we come and we look and and we, we give, we have a, a Flickr site where we keep all of our pictures and videos that we take from a site visit. And then we compose a page of photographs just to detail each, which, and we saw some of those photographs before. I wouldn't let my team really, um, not wouldn't, I didn't want them to read the pricing on the Stantec report before we came, even though we had access to it, I blocked it off. I didn't want any preconceived notions on the pricing for the repair of your bridge. Uh, so that's, that's where we started. Your bridge is skewed just a little bit. Um, you know, the, the maintenance of a fully restored bridge is very little. You need to keep the debris off of it. You need to keep the shoes clean. You need to keep, you know, the paint, if somebody gets on there with graffiti, I don't think they will anymore because I did hear what ensued. <laughs> and uh, that the maintenance is very low on a bridge like that. It needs to be washed, it needs to be kept clean. It needs to have all that shrubbery and greenery that's growing around it needs to be gone. That causes damage. So our first option was the full, um, the full restoration of your bridge over the river. $1,124,920. It seems pretty expensive. Um, the Stantec report was closer to 1.6 million. That's because we, we get rid of some of the unknowns. So those contingencies can come down. It's not that that's so much off, but when you don't know some things, you add a lot more in to cover your bases. So we think we have a pretty good price here for, for doing this bridge across the river. The funny thing is I called two painters, one that wasn't in the area. The other one was the one that gave the bid for the Stantec report. We thought we could perhaps encapsulate your bridge, wash it, and use a new technology of encapsulating the lead paint. They convinced me that at that point, what's the point? You might as well go all the way down to bare metal, get rid of the lead so it won't be an issue for future generations. So we kept that in there. So just going down the list, our engineering is a percentage of the total, and that would get into the modeling required to go forward with a full working plan set. The equipment rentals, the crane, keeping it on site, um, working over the water, again, $70,000, quite expensive. Construction management, that's me, the working drawings, again, the engineer. Demolition to remove the asphalt, you can read 39,000 and then you have to get in there and remove the stringers and the floor beams. All the while you have built a false um, decking below using cable and tented the whole bridge because none of that lead can escape. So it's quite an expensive project to build an entire box around your bridge. <clears throat> but as I said when we were here before, the, the site really looked pretty tight. All this um, spring I've been thinking that it could go down quite differently. $650,000 out of that is for paint. And that's not us adding any percentage because they've already got ya. That's what a nonprofit can do. Trash and cleanup, so there's your total. Um, you can see that the road deck, we, we base at about $200 a plank. 
for white oak planks, um, railing. We were just going to replace the one section that is missing and add maybe something a little bit above it to get up to 48 inches high. Keep your curbing. Um, remove the highway guardrail. Let's go back one page and down. The, the bridge itself, those spans were about $180,000 to um, get rid of the packed rust, replace the shoes, replace the rods and the stringers, floor beams. So that price really probably remains pretty close to what it would be in, in any situation. Then we have an option to just reopen your bridge. Again, I thought the deck deterioration was much worse than it appeared to us. Um, this is not an option that the city would like to see happen without going into further detail on beefing up some of the other structural items. The, where we depart a little bit, and it gets a little technical, but the Secretary of the Interior has standards for bridge restoration that call for um, modeling at 85 pounds per square foot, which means that every one of you has to stand just like this and then jump up and down um, in, in an area. We have now corroboration from three different engineers that these pedestrian bridges, 85 pounds was a very conservative estimate, probably more like 30 pounds per square foot that you should go to. The Ashto is a guideline, it's not a standard. And we're moving more towards occupancy and loading as opposed to pounds loading. So 50 people or 150 people at a time on your bridge. So that's an engineering thing and it's something that we can work out with with Ned, so our, our concepts for um, repairing the U-bolt that is broken and, and your bit of guardrail, fixing and patching the deck are not something that the city really wants to do. So we'll take another look at, at beefing up some of, uh, some of the structural items that, that might see your bridge get open for the summer. I can't guarantee the outcome of this. We just put it forward. I know that after we heard Ned's concerns, I went back to my engineer. We still stand behind the fact that you could open this up for the type of low usage that you would have over the summer. But those risks aren't ours to bear. So I completely understand the city's um, observations. However, so you had 20,300 if we ran some chain link down to sort of guard the deck, which didn't really need to be happening. Again, coming back the second time when you have no snow has been enlightening. <clears throat> Here we get into box steel's um, assessments of, uh, of the section loss. This is around the bridge shoe. The lateral bracing, that's all the rods will be replaced. Here's an example here of a shoe that's been replaced using rivets, new pins. So you can see it goes from this to this. They cut it right here, they weld it together, and you have a clean, clear shoe on each of the four ends. This is the, um, the lower cord connection with a U-bolt and, and how we would fabricate another U-bolt that would look just like it and perform just like it. Parts are parts in cars and bridges. Even as a woman that's not a mechanic, I know that parts are replaceable. And we have just the guy to make those parts. That's, the, that's what Working Bridges brings to the table. You can't just go to the store and buy them. All of the, the lower cord connections on all of the verticals of your bridge are really in really great shape. Um, what we have to do, however, is pull off the stringers and the floor beams to move forward.
<clears throat> your existing hand railing. I can't tell you how unique this is and the fact that we have never really seen it before. It has a curve to it where your hand grips it. It has connector plates that, that have the same shape inside that hold it together. Um, these pieces can be fixed. The rosettes can be molded in Kelowna, Iowa, another place that we've found wonderful bridge lovers do wonderful things and there's a foundry there that could make the rosettes to, to replace any that we might need to. Those rosettes tie the, the vertical, the lacing bars together with rivets. This is a picture of, you saw, you saw Nels walking up your inclined end post and then walking along the top of the bridge. He makes it look really easy. And, uh, but this is what he found up there is, this is a splice plate. Let's raise that up a little. Or not. Oh, there we go. And this is, these are the cast connections for the portal bracing that tie in and allow it to skew at an angle. These are all very well designed cast pieces that tie your bridge together and keep it in tension and compression. Um, it's unusual, it's beautiful. You don't get to see it very often unless somebody gets up there on top. There's a little bit of packed rust. You can see where that plate is pushed up just a little bit. You can use a pneumatic hammer and heat and a flat plate to, to shake that packed rust out. And then those, those just all have to go. And it's not, and it is typical of many bridges. It's not, it just is that that's, that's what water does to steel. If you don't, you have to take care of it. You have to paint it. Um, but if the water is not getting through and just hanging there, it, it takes longer. But what, Ned, it will always fall apart, right? This is an existing floor beam. They're not original. That's what we would replace it with if we were to get this job. Okay, so. That's just some other sort of details that can be found on other bridges. Um, just examples. Now, there are samples of this report that you can look at in the binder that Heidi referred to. Uh, I can also put those PDFs um, up and, uh, and put them on your, your website where you can easily access those for more information. This is just a blip in time. So, all, all spring it just niggled at me that this is still an expensive repair for this bridge. And, and it doesn't have to be that way. I get that things are more expensive on the East Coast. Massachusetts is expensive. My shirt costs less than my lobster roll. <laughs> but the lobster roll was so good. <laughs> Just down the street, we do come and spend money in your local economy. So I took a look at the site and lo and behold, it looked a lot bigger without your piles of snow around it. And yes, there still is conduit carrying the gas line across the bridge, and there are still uh, utility poles that would need to be managed, but there is an alternative route out for the local community. And we think that, I thought, I have to convince my guys, but um, I thought that we could pull this bridge off and perhaps put it in, um, Thank you. Alternative recycling right across the road there. So Heidi and I both independently called the, the owner name. Patrick Kennedy. Patrick Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy called me back after he couldn't get a hold of Heidi because she was moving equipment down here and thought that that was a wonderful idea and that although he couldn't say, yes, yeah, sure, go ahead, he thought it would be completely appropriate that they would be able to donate some land usage for putting your bridge during restoration. So there, now we have the potential. It could, 
it would be some disruption to your community down on Main Street. You're going to lose power for a day on the, on the pull and on the day for the, the reset. But the cost of a crane to pull this with one pick is less than $30,000. The restoration cost from the steel company would go down because they're not having to use a crane out over the river. The cost of painting and blasting your bridge probably go to a third. Everything comes way down if you don't have to fix it over the river. And it was this one man that said, hmm, it's a tentative yes, but if we can work out the contracts and the usage and get everybody on board towards front fundraising, I think you're looking at way less than $700,000, maybe closer to 500 for your bridge to be completely restored with in-kind restoration techniques that mean a rivet is replaced with a rivet, a uh, floor beam is built up to look like it did in the past. The railing gets fixed to its original, even if we have to add in some cable. And you have your bridge back. And I think you can fundraise to those levels as a community. I've seen it done before. I've seen it done in a town of 1,500 people that raised $50,000 in four months. They did that with some of those things that I passed around. The calla lily was a $100 donation. That was a gift. We're big into the gifts. We did that by selling naming rights to every plank that goes on the Bunker Mill Bridge. Um, so you get a number. That's my plank. $200 a plank donation. It was 100 in Iowa. You people can do too. <laughs> uh, you have floor beams and stringers that can be identified with a price. I had Nels cut out the names of the people that donated $450 for, it's just the metal of the, of the floor beams. We sold all seven of them without a problem, $450. Again, cut out steel names, they'll be there forever, attached right to your bridge. Uh, you could make, instead of the flowers, you could have my friends cast a rosette from your railing. That'd be a nice commemorative paperweight. I was just in California where the Golden Gate Bridge is selling rivets. I had to take the box away because it was made in China. <laughs> we don't do that. We are, we're very much about buying local, about buying U.S. steel, about um, about using local resources when we come in. We can't guarantee that we would be the experts to do your bridge restoration, but we're here to tell you that you can do it. And we would love to help as you go along towards making a decision with your city. If we can come up with a way to satisfy um, some strengthening of the diagonal connections and the lateral rod connections for, um, for a cost that we don't maybe have to use the chain link fencing, maybe we can get your bridge open for the interim. It's not my decision. Contact your local representatives that vote. Um, but again, the public-private partnership is one to really build on, and I applaud you for that. Are there any questions? Am I supposed to carry this? still having trouble convincing some of your guys of this new this they just thought the site was too tight yeah. and didn't even want to help me come up with numbers in the, the in the spring alternative recycling right yeah. that because it was i mean your mounds of snow were just really you know there wasn't any room so i think now with photographs that i've taken and we still haven't contacted your um your utility company. I mean, this is a question that you all have to answer. Do you want us to go forward now on this final option that we think may really provide that potential for a full restoration, complete lead abatement, so your 
grandchildren's children won't have to deal with that issue anymore. You've taken care of that. We've done it as low cost as we can. I think that's the option to go for. I always have. I think my guys will be behind it. It's just that there's a lot of little things that have to happen. So while it was important to be here during the ice age, <laughs> because, and, and that ice was gone the next week, really, wasn't it? I mean, it started raining and puddling that day. So we really, it was good timing. But we were able to get out and look at the, the underneath. Just sorry, follow up. Is there any steel loss that is, will bring money in because of the value of steel that's being? Steel right now is $170 a ton. There's no real value to the steel. It could be a little, and you can have it. I, I kind of offered that to the recycling company, going, well, can you handle the, this? And you know, is there a trade in there for you to have the steel? And if we were to run it as a nonprofit, that's the kind of work that we would do. You can't do that as a, as a city-owned bridge. But there are, again, that public-private partnership that can be helpful. Yes? Your experience and some, something you wrote in the binder back here about a grant that you got for another bridge. What's your current um, experience with grants? Um, Availability and where do you go? If, if your city is behind you, the county is behind you for transportation alternative program money um, through the DOT, it's out there. It, it, it requires a, a match fund to go with it. Uh, re SHPO, your state historic preservation grants, not likely. They're, it's just too big of a project. Uh, you have some CPA funds, is that correct, that you can apply for that might come up with two thirds of some of it. Again, you're gonna have to have a match. Grants are really hard to find. It's, in my opinion, it's much better to sell the bridge to us and let us do it with all of your money and then put it back together and give it back because it takes it out of um, all the bureaucratic nonsense that you have to go through. Okay, I said it, I'm sorry. Uh, on the other hand, I wanna tell you that as of last Friday, Governor Markell of Delaware was, saw our project concept for a historic bridge park encompassing five bridges in Northern Delaware. Through the DNR in an environmental cleanup, um, program and they have established that we are a sole source contract for the state for historic bridge delivery which means that our experts are enough different and there aren't very many people that go around and do what we do in order to bring the top level of craftsmanship to a job it's not that people aren't doing it but we really give it all we can in order to derive an in-kind restoration that will last for generations. So grants are tough, can be done, but it's hard. How long will it take to, from the time you start a job until it's done? I mean, are we talking From the planning position, years, it, could years? it could be years. Planning could be years, funding could be years. If, if you were to you get- If you had the money, if you had the money and we were to start working, we could have it done and cleaned up and back probably within 60 days. That's amazing. So if you, any of you out here got those deep pockets, <laughs> we, we can take your donations as a tax deductible write-off. So. Anybody else? Well, I was just wondering <laughs> if, if it were restored, do you, do you have a recommended schedule for you know painting? You mentioned it had to be painted again. How it's you, it's you 30 paint? years on a three on a three paint step process. 30 years is the uh, is what their warranty is. That's warranty on a bridge that's being used by traffic. Again, if you clean it and keep up with nicks and dents that happen over time. Um, it could last a long time. People generally let the paint go way too long till it fades. So, but you have to keep it clean. You have to do the maintenance. I noticed that a lot of like on the rail trails, they put up these bridges and they don't touch them. They just let them rust. And they say that is, it creates a patina and that in effect protects the metal. What if they just sandblasted it and put it back without actually 
Yeah. That's a different kind of steel. I was corrected at the conference I was just at. I called it Corten steel. They call it weathering steel now that is supposed to get that patina that stops it from rusting more. Um, again, an engineer that I just talked to said that the weathering steel works well in well-ventilated areas, but if you get it into a, a cut, and where there isn't a lot of air movement, it deteriorates pretty quickly. Plus, it's messy. You've seen, you've seen that weathered steel bridges and, and the abutments are just streaked with rust. So it can be used. There are places where I would like to use it where we don't want to paint the rest of the bridge. Given that we have to put so much new steel into your bridge, it really does need to be painted. Many times we just saw a bridge in Oregon, a railroad bridge that is beautiful, pristine, and it has no damage because it didn't have the salts, et cetera, that were used when it was open as a, as a roadway. Thank you. The new parts will be iron or steel? Excuse me? The new parts will be iron or They'll be steel, yes. Can you repeat the question? Oh, well, the new... Sorry, sorry. Okay, your question, sir. Will the replacement parts be iron or steel? They'll be new steel. But with proper paint that will last as long as iron does. It will, it will last. Um, and, you know, like this, it, th that was caused by corrosion. It may still... The steel may go quicker than the iron but we don't have any options of using iron for the floor beams or the stringers. They just don't make them. Hmm. Yes? If the end game is to try to get a uh, pedestrian friendly bridge, what other recommendations do you have for decking rather than asphalt? Oh, I, would, I, I recommend timber decking uh, and we go, we recommend white oak planks uh, or pine, oak, it would have been whatever was local that they would have made planks out of. Um, yes, and we recommend them. There are many different systems that different engineers are, are specking now. In Texas, they're specking a basketball glue lamb floor and eight foot pan, four foot panels, 12 feet wide. That doesn't allow for maintenance later. It might be great for structural integrity and helping some of the, the sway loading, but it doesn't do anything for a county that has to go back out and hire equipment to pull up a, a bad piece. And it, the glue seems to be coming out of it. So go, go standard. Let that water go through and not stand on the steel. Uh, and, and that should last 25, 30 years, 50 years with, with the trap. You're not going to have, again, vehicular traffic on it unless you wanted to run a a blade across it. Can you give it a, a rough comparison? It was, what, $6,600 or $5,600 for asphalt. What would you guess for wood planking? Oh, I can tell you. Oh, I think it was 39000 installed there, or $32,000. It was, um, the planks are at $100 a piece. Then we have a clipping system that attaches the planks to the stringers in order to keep them on. We. At the time we were talking on yours, that those clips were $14 a piece installed. We have now decided through another engineer that we can manufacture those clips out of angle iron. So the cost can come down. Nobody liked the cost of the decking clips, so. Can you repeat that? Because I thought it was $5,600 for the asphalt. See, I didn't spec in asphalt. Asphalt is. Ours and asphalt might be well cheaper, but that didn't include the the pan that you put under it. We would not we would not spec asphalt decking on a restored bridge that isn't going back to vehicular traffic. There is no point. We would put the planks um, on a horizontal rather than a longitudinal way so that bikes can go across it easily. Ned, do you think we could get some uh, sustainably harvest wood out of the uh, watershed lands, possibly, for use in the, in the planks? I don't know who's asking the question. It's not it's not fine. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's something we could discuss. 
We did that with um, some Amish wood that had been donated a couple of trees in Iowa and they're, they're resting there for their bridge. They've been milled. Hi, Ned. <laughs> Over here. Oh, I know you, I just heard you're on vacation, but you came anyway. I don't know if thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but this really, you're critical. And I'm just wondering if you have anything to tell us where the city stands on this in terms of um, supporting this kind of proposal, sticking with the Stantec proposal, but the differences are, um, and what, you know, would be a holdout issue for or yourself and the advisory board, whatever it's called now. Um, so. I think, I think the biggest issue at the moment is actually working on the structural elements to make sure that they're going to be set going forward. There's a number of issues with loading on the, uh, on the cording system that need to be strengthened as part of it. And granted, we can have a further discussion about the pedestrian loading, because 85 is high, but that's one of the things that Asheville recommends. And so basically, we have some flaws in the bridges now that people shouldn't be on it. And that's what we need to address first. But I support the project. I, I work through this process with the CPA grant and uh, look forward to doing something out here at some point. I just don't have a time frame and currently there's no funding right now. <laughs> However, what you have now with, with both these reports is a real good way of setting up a project and making good informed decisions. Um, if the city, we, we could come in if people want us to and help you work out a plan to address the city's concerns on that loading issues that were identified in the Stantec report. There are ways to um, add strength to some of those members until we get to the point where that would be new material, most likely, some of it. Um, and so we could go ahead and do that if the, if the group wants us to do that and, and continue to work towards the, the lower funding for getting your bridge open, um, if we can do that. The other thing is then to turn around and just start looking at, um, with the information we've provided, you have the ability to go forward and write a grant for the repair in place of the bridge, which keeps it over your river, keeps the gas line going, you know, it's doable, it's just bigger equipment, more time needed in order to protect the river. That's essentially what it's for. Uh, or, you know, again, your choice to go forward and, and, and say, let's go one step further and find out the full cost, the full real cost for um, uh, rehabilitation on land. That gets it down and, and so that every part of it can be looked at, tuned, put back up and opened. Those are your decisions. Um, but we hope that we've helped clarify some of that and brought it more into the layman's terms than, than perhaps what, how engineers would speak to you. And I try to, I try to play the liaison between an engineer and, and the people because sometimes they use terms that y you think you might understand because you know what the words are, but they don't really compute for what they mean. I'm speaking of a fracture critical bridge, a structurally deficient bridge you hear all the time now. Structurally deficient, what do you think that means? That's gonna fall down tomorrow. No, what it really means is that it's not big enough, tall enough, or wide enough to handle the traffic of today. Functionally obsolete, the same thing, it's just too low, um, won't handle it. So. Those are the things with our infrastructure. We're not trying to make this a vehicular bridge. And we think that there are some compromises that can, can be made to where you can have your bridge back open. Mm -hmm. Yes. So could you just review the temporary fix that you said would be possible to right. do the limited fare necessities to reopen the bridge. Right, well that's the one where, where Ned has suggested that we need to beef up some more of the laterals. So what we had, our thing is that bridge has been in this state for a very long time. 
It may have more degradation than it had 10 years ago when it was closed, but they kept it open to pedestrians. The reason they closed the bridge this time was they found the, the U-bolt was missing. That was the nail in the coffin. There are two holes in the deck. So there might be in and ups and downs and the pan is falling apart up below, but, but it's been that way for a long time. Me, I would say open it up and let you use it. The city has other concerns. So, but the, what you're proposing for a temporary fix would be about how much would that cost? Well, one of them, see, and now I'm even thinking that they weren't right. I don't think you need to do much more than replace the section of guardrail that's missing to open it back up, grandfather it back to the way it was and open. That's what I would do. That cost is less than $20,000 even including some of that probably beefing up of those cords. I would and stick with that. that. It wouldn't be like this is a temporary thing and then we're going to have to, that money is just kind of thrown away so it can be open immediately. That's work that would go towards restoring. Uh, no, way. you would probably get a new U-bolt on the restoration the next time. Maybe not, but uh, it is work that that money wouldn't be recoverable. If we put chain link fencing down it, to, to make it a little, I was just, I specced in that chain link fencing thinking that the deck was far more deteriorated than it is. I've seen them in Minnesota where they just put plate steel over those holes. So, and, and keep going. And it's not pretty, but it is functional. Ned, um, here, okay. um, so. The bridge can only take a certain amount, a certain load right now with the degradation underneath. That's correct. Right, okay. So um, I know you were talking about like that 85 pound and all of that. Lead Civic Association is not going to have 150 people on the bridge. We know that. Um, in order to get it open for the summer, um, isn't it possible, I've seen roadways with signs that say pass at your own risk and whatnot to take the liability issue out of the city's way. Uh, post on either side, you know, you know, pass at your own risk. And I mean, people, there's not going to be more than probably 500 pounds on that bridge at a time. And what happens if it's on the to the bridge? Well, I say to open it. I, this, is the, this is the issue that I have with it, is that the engineers have found some structural defaults with it that need to be repaired. And the reason we closed off the bridge with the, the fencing was that we don't want people on the bridge. It's dangerous. <coughs> well, that's not a fun note to end on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, Again, and, and where I can go around with Ned is that their modeling was based on, let's look at the, why you're doing what you're doing and how they base their modeling. And, and maybe the other thing to do is to have our engineer go back through and model that and, and see what we come up with on those deficient areas that you're calling out. I, uh, we're willing to go forward and, and try to see where that is. Again, I go back to the fact that it hasn't really failed in 140 years. So that engineering has to be looked at, and I think that the experience that our engineers bring to the table may skew that a little bit differently because we look at it as loading as opposed to those guidelines that the Secretary of Interior has given out. And they are guidelines, but they are standards that many people use as standards as opposed to a knowing and a guideline. But I'd like to be able to work a little bit more with Ned and, and identify that. I mean, I've seen, I've seen people go in and take steel cable to beef up those diagonals, add a steel cable throughout that, that adds enough kips to it to, to get it up to 50 kips as opposed to 36 kips. Those are engineering terms that I sound like I know what I'm talking about, don't I? I don't really, but I understand that you can sandwich things together to get up to the loading that we need. So we'd be happy to look at that um, again on getting it open. It's
it seems to me that that's the important part. You don't want it to just sit there. Even if it isn't open, you should go to the approaches and hang out and look at your river. Get rid of all the grub, all those trees and bamboo and poison ivy and bittersweet. Get that out of there. Keep it clean and continue to fundraise for, for the future. Julie? Yes. If we were going to, if we were going to look at the proposal to actually lift the bridge, if you were going to look at the proposal to actually lift the bridge, crane it over onto the alternative site, um, there'd be a cost for that. You would have to. What would be the cost for that? To well, that, that plan? you know, I told you that I. Because we came early, and part of our original agreement was that we would have this meeting with the group, we have exhausted the $6,000 that was paid to us originally. So it's hard for me to go, well, we didn't quite look at that in your $6,000. But, but we were here, and we, we were doing our diligence. I think that it would, it would take about an... If I had another thousand dollars, I would be happy to go through the process, contact the, the utility company, contact the crane company, get the weight of the bridge with the decking on it, without the decking, look at the cost for the permitting of that to get it pulled, talk more with, um, with the recycling company about the use of that land. I can't even tell you what that yes means to your project mm -hmm. because that's the kind of community involvement that you're looking to get from people. Will, will the gas company take over their part and run the gas around? I don't know, can they do that topically, Ned, and just run a gas line around without digging it in until they don't do temporary? And see, I don't know who that's serving or, or what, but that's a cost. Um, wouldn't it be nice if you could take this opportunity to uh, to get rid of all that overhead electricity and dig it underneath. That would be my, my uh, recommendation if you have that opportunity, take it. But there's a lot of electric poles there. So there's a fair amount of work to do to define those costs. Um, but again, if you can get your electric company to work with, with you, they won't do it for it, nothing, but they might be able to consult on the easiest way to do it. But you were guessing at about 500000 but you, you, for the extra money, you would give us a real number of actions. Yes, that would be the point of that and to figure out the time factor on that. But that was just me running it in my head. I could never come up with another $650,000 on the painting thing. I don't know what they would cost to bring their equipment out. I know that if we shipped it back to Michigan, took it all apart, shipped it to Michigan to the, the painter that we use, that would blast and paint it in pieces, ship it back, it would probably be less than $200,000. It might be more to bring the, the equipment that the painter needs to bring out um, in order to suck out all the lead on site. On site is always expensive. Those two routes are, are something that we would look at. So again, you would have an idea of the cost of, of your so choices. Would you be looking at both possibilities? We would, absolutely. Yes, and I'd go right back to Aceron, is that the name of the painting? I think, Ashuri, I'm not sure. Um, but they just laughed, oh, we, we already did this quote last year. There aren't a lot of painting companies to call that specialize in the lead paint. And quite frankly, I would, I would push for federal highway and, and perhaps the state to pay for the lead paint abatement because it is, after all, their choice to put that lead paint on and because it works so well. But we stopped using it in the 80s. And now it's up to all these communities to come up with how do we get rid of that from our environment. I don't know any real good ways. They're all expensive. But we are shipping bridges from Oregon and Pennsylvania to Michigan and then back. We're pretty solid with our transportation costs and, and that gets it out of the way. So there are costs to convenience as well. Um. Thank you so much really for allowing us to come to your town.